Okay. Hey everyone, my name is Jimmy. Covariance and contravariance are really funny words that, if you're anything like me, you don't really use them in day-to-day -day sentences, except for the sentence, what is contravariance and covariance? I remember the first time I heard these words. Six years ago, I was developing web applications in C-sharp.net. When C-sharp 4.0 came out, one of, the features was one of the features that was introduced was support for covariant and contravariant type parameters for generics. Being naturally curious, I thought, what does that mean? What can I do with it? I've been programming without this. Why do I need it now? Now I'm an iOS developer for Capital One. I'm working on the mobile app. When I joined, Swift was announced, and it was a very exciting time. It's much better than Objective-C. It's a very new language, but it's growing and getting better rapidly. This past October, one of the features that was in Swift 2.1 release was that conversions between function types are supported, exhibiting covariance in function result types and contravariance functions and parameter types. Cool. But C Sharp has had that since 2.0. Swift would, would be a much more powerful language if it supported variance in generics. At this point, you're probably thinking, hey, Jimmy, that's cool and all, but I don't use Swift or C Sharp, and I don't even understand half of the things you're saying. How is this going to benefit me? Fear not, all will be explained. Before, before we begin, let me show you, show you some situations where understanding variance can help explain potential issues. Let's say that I have a string. For this example, I'm going to use Java. Now, the L in, solid or, in object oriented programming principle, solid, stands for Liskov substitution principle. According to this, if I have a reference to a supertype, I should be able to reference an instance of a derived class and not have to know of its actual type. This means that I can reference my um, string type with an object type. Now my object reference uh, refer references the string. I can do any objecty thing with it that I want, such as calling hash code or the toString methods on it. Because all strings are objects, my class also has these, me these methods, and it's safe and valid to call them. Now I can reassign it to an. Um, I can also reassign it to a, another string or another object, such as an integer, if I wanted to. And I can treat all of those as objects, because they're all objects. Now let's say that we have a lot of strings. I'm going to represent this as a string of arrays, an array of strings. Since all strings are objects, it seems like I should be able to treat these arrays as an array of objects. It seems logical to say that an array of strings is an array of objects. We can create a reference to it, the object array and refer to the previously created string array. Now, similar to before, I should be able to treat it like an object array without knowing that it's a string array. A common thing to do is store things in the array. So I can put strings in the array, and I can put, also put other objects, like integers. Now, this code will compile successfully. Great, perfect. Now let's run our program and, uh oh Looks like it crashed. But our program compiles. What gives? You may have already noticed, but when I assign the reference of the string array to the object array, we're only grabbing a reference to the string array. Underneath the hood, it's still a string array, and we obviously can't add integers into a string array. So why did the compiler allow me to treat the string array as if it were an object array, when it obviously can't be treated the same? If the compiler prevented me from doing this in the first place, this would have saved me a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of headache, a lot of embarrassment, all due to the simple runtime exception. This all stems from the fact that an array of strings is not an array of objects, even though a string is an object. But why? Why did the compiler let me do this? Java is supposed to be a type-safe language, but this isn't type-safe at all. Is Java broken? Why is the language being used in over 3 billion devices should we all stop using Java and switch to Scala or Clojure or some other language? <laughs> to be fair, Java can catch this for you, but only if you use a different type. If we try the same example using an ArrayList, 
the compiler will now stop us as expected, saying that an array list of strings is not compatible with an array list of objects. Fantastic, this is great. The compiler is preventing us from making an illogical action. It's doing what it's meant to do. Hopefully now you have a sense that variance has something to do with types, especially when um, it relates to an inner type that has a subtype relationship. Let's start defining what these terms mean so we can be clear about what we're talking about. I'm throwing the around, around the term variance a lot, but what does it really mean? Variance is a noun with two parts. Vary is the root, and ants is the suffix. Vary should be a familiar word. It means to change or be different. As programmers, we deal with variables, things that can vary or change over time, unless, of course, you're working in a purely functional programming language. Ants is a suffix that indicates the state, action, or quality of something. This is similar to how you can ask for guidance or prepare for an acceptance speech. Put vary and ants together, and you get variance, the quality of how something changes or differs. And usually this, it usually describes how two things differs or changes. In our case, the things are types, but I'll get to more on that in a little bit. Variance is the general concept, but if you want to talk about a specific thing that exhibits variance, you call that a variant, a thing that varies. It's used as a noun or adjective. Typically, we'll say this type parameter exhibits a covariant behavior, or this is a contravariant type parameter. There are many different kinds of variants, but in this talk, we are, we'll only care about three, covariance, contravariance, and invariance. Co is a prefix that means with or together. You have coworkers, people you, who you work with. You may collaborate together or work together. Similarly, a covariant is a thing that varies with another thing, as if it always has a positive correlation. The bad part about this, and why you may get really confused, is because in mathematics, co generally means the complete opposite thing, representing the other thing in a structure that has a dual nature. More accurately, you may think of this as the complement of the structure. Let's take trigonometry, for instance. You have these trigonomic functions, sine, tangent, and secant, which represents the ratios of specific sides or angles of a right triangle. These functions have complementary functions, cosine, cotangent, cosecant, which represents the complementary angle or side. You may have also learned in, um, in this at this conference about functors and, mo and monads, and maybe even about co-functors and co-monads. These represent the categorical dual of functors and monads. In general, they have the notion of reversing arrows. But when we're talking about covariance, it doesn't mean that we're reversing the arrows. It actually means we're going with the arrows. It means that the type that we're varying, um, we're varying we are varying with some other type the complete opposite. If we want to talk about reversing the arrows or having a type that varies against or in the opposite direction of another type, we call that a contravariant. Contra is a prefix that means against or opposite, like in contrast, or when you make a contradiction, you're making an opposing statement. Therefore, contravariant is a thing that varies against another thing, as if it always has a negative correlation. That's the first two kind of variants, varying with and varying against. The third type of variance describes when types have no relation with each other. In is a prefix that represents negation, and it means not, like in infinite, not finite, or independent, not dependent on others. And invariant is something that does not vary with another thing. These two types have no relation with each other. So now, you know, now you know the three primary ways that two types can, vary, can relate with each other. They can vary with, they can vary against, or they can not vary with each other. But it, what exactly do I mean when I say types can vary with each other? And what exactly is this relationship that the types have with each other? Are they cousins? Are they domestic partners? Of course not. Those are human relationships. We're talking about type relationships. Specifically, the relationship I'm talking about is is a. This is the same relationship for saying that a cat is an animal, or a banana is a fruit, a string is an object. 
This is a subtype relationship, and also referred to as type polymorphism because you can treat one type as another type. Note that the relationships are only one way. All bananas are fruits, but not all fruits are bananas. They're also transitive. All bulldogs are dogs, and all dogs are animals. Therefore, all bulldogs are also animals. In this regard, subtypes have a sense of direction and order. You can go along with this relationship, or in reverse, going against the subtypes. Now that we're clear about the relationships, uh, that of the relationships these types can have, a subtype relationship, how can another type vary with or against this relationship? In general, types are independent of each other. One, can one type can have its own subtype structure, and another type can have a completely different subtype structure. To answer this, we have to go to a special kind of type, one that depends on another type. Of course, I'm talking about parametri parametric polymorphic types, also known as generics or parameterized types. These types have a predefined structure filled with properties and methods that you can call. However, before you can start working with them, they require some other type to work. When the inner type has a relationship with another type, you may be inclined to believe that the overall type follows a similar relationship. This is a natural thing to believe. If you have a basket of apples, wouldn't you call that a basket of fruits? Let's think about that for a second. Hmm. Is that a basket of fruits? Hmm. Well, everything in the basket is an apple, and all apples are fruits. Therefore, everything in this basket is a fruit. So this must be a fruit basket. I mean, it's a basket with only one type of fruit, um, but it's still a basket of fruits. In this sense, it almost seems as if a basket of apples is a basket of fruits. Since apple is a fruit, a basket of apple should follow that relationship, should go with that relationship, and also be a basket of fruits. Baskets seem to exhibit a covariant behavior with respect to its inner type. But wait, earlier I said that you can't treat an array list of strings as an array list of objects, even though a string is an object. Why? What's going on? Is an array list somehow different from a basket? Was something wrong with my reasoning about the fruits basket? Mm, no, everything I said before was true. So why is there a feeling that something's not right here? Actually, there is something going on. There's a secret here that will explain everything. Knowing this is the key to variance. And that secret is sources and sinks. Sources and sinks. Okay, maybe I should explain that a little bit more. A source is something that provides data, similar to how a database or a file can be the source of data, or how a faucet is a source of water. A sink is something that you can put data into. It's kind of like a black hole where you can throw everything into it and it just never comes out. Or it's kind of like a sink drain where water goes in and you don't really care where it goes after that. It might go to the sewers, it might go to a lake, that's implementation detail. Another way to say this is that a source represents a read-only data type, and a sync represents a write-only data type. This is important because sources are covariant, and sinks are contravariant. Let's take a look at some examples that might explain this further. Let's say that I have a read-only fruits basket. Making it read-only means that we can treat it covariantly. Since an apple is a fruit, a basket of apples is a basket of fruits. So I should be able to assign it just like this. Now I can pull out any type of fruit from the fruit basket. This works because I'll only get out apples from it, and every apple is a fruit. If I try to put in a fruit like a banana, that won't work. Even though the basket is a fruit basket, and you can't, uh, the data structure is actually an apple basket, and you can't put a banana in an apple basket. With our pre previous example, we were trying to treat the array like a covariant data structure. Now you should be able to see that since we can write to it, it, may, it might be contravariant. It's not contravariant because you can also read from arrays. Therefore, 
read-write data structures are actually invariants. We've covered how subtyping works with read-only and read-write data structures. Next, let's take a look at sinks, or write-only data structures. Sinks exhibit contravariant behavior. Let's say that we have a monkey zoo where I can send all my monkeys to. Since I only care about giving my monkeys away, uh, the zoo can have a contravariant behavior. This, um, this means that the subtype relationship reverses. A monkey is an animal, but a monkey zoo is not an animal zoo. Actually, an animal zoo is a monkey zoo. I can add monkeys to this zoo. This is because an animal zoo can hold monkeys, just like a monkey zoo. I can't try to get a monkey out of it. This is because the underlying data structure might actually hold more than just monkeys. They might have giraffes and elephants because the underlying data structure is actually just a zoo of animals. This is why a sink exhibits contravariant behavior. Let's see how we can manipulate this in various languages. So there's only a handful of languages that supports um, explicit type variance annotations. Primarily, it's C Sharp, Scala, OCaml, Java, Kotlin. There may be more, but these are the ones that I found. This concept doesn't apply much to languages like Haskell, because in ha um, it doesn't use subtype polymorphism. Instead, it offers ad hoc polymorphism through type classes. Other languages like Swift says that everything is an invariant, just for some simplicity. Scala and OCaml uses plus and minus to represent covariance and contravariance. You can think of it as con covariance has having a positive relationship and contravariance having a negative or re reversed relationship. C Sharp and Kotlin is a bit more interesting. They chose to use the keywords out and in. In this case, out represents covariance and in represents contravariance. This is actually pretty intuitive. This is because your inputs are covariant and your outputs, sorry, your inputs are contravariant and your inputs are covariant. Now I know what you're thinking. That doesn't make much sense. When I pass something into a function, I should be able to pass in a subtype, not a supertype. Shouldn't this be a covariant parameter? And you're right. It, but it actually depends on the perspective that you take. If you're thinking about it from the caller's perspective, it is a covariant input parameter. However, when you consider it from the callee's perspective, it gets reversed and becomes contravariant. This means that we can treat the input parameter as if it was one of its supertypes. Similarly, when we return a value from inside the function, the return value is covariant. We can return a subtype. But when you look at it from the caller's perspective, the output became contravariant. We can treat the return data as if it was one of its supertypes. The way to think about this is that any time you receive a value, whether it's from the output of a function call or the input of a function, you treat it contravariantly. If you're transmitting data either into function calls or, or from a function, you treat it covariantly. This is also known as the robustness principle. The variance switches based on perspective. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Similarly, one function's output is another function's input. It's the same thing, but you're seeing it from two different perspectives. Let's create a basket structure in C Sharp. Here's the interface for it. Notice how I can get something from the basket, and I can put something into the basket. Therefore, it's an invariant structure. Uh, let's say that we want to make this a read-only data structure. We can do this by marking the type parameter as covariant by using the out key keyword, as we only want to get something out of the basket. Now, if you actually try to compile this, the c -sharp compiler is actually smart enough to know that this isn't a valid structure since we left the put method in there, which has an input of t. The compiler warning states, invalid variance, type parameter t must be contravariantly valid on basket put T is covariant. So now the next time you see this message, hopefully you'll know what to do. In this case, we can just remove the put method. And now we have a read-only basket with just the get method. 
Similarly, to make this a write-only basket, we mark the type parameter uh, with the in keyword since we only want to put things into the basket. We'll also have to remove the get method or else the compiler will complain. Now we have contravariant basket with just a put method. Here's the, Scala behaves in the same way. Here's the similar generic basket in Scala with the get and put method. To make it read-only, we'll mark it as a covariant by using plus. If we don't remove put, the compiler will say covariant type T occurs in contravariant position in type T of value thing. Of course, that's because we're using T in a contravariant position. If we remove the put, then everything will be fine and we have our read-only basket. For the write-only basket, we'll use minus to mark it as contravariant and remove the get method. Now we, can put th now we can only put things into the basket. Because we've marked the basket as covariant or contravariant, we can treat the basket of apples as a basket of fruits if it's covariant. And we can treat the basket of fruits as a basket of apples if it's contravariant. And that's basically all that variance is, giving subtype polymorphic behavior to parametric polymorphic types. That's a tongue twister. These are examples of declaration site variance annotations. This is because we're defining what the variance is at design time. There's another kind called use site variance annotations. This one is used by Java and Kotlin. This is because you can define your generic types first without specifying what kind of variance it has. Instead, the developer, uses the class can say, developer that uses the class can say if they want to use it in a co covariant or contravariant way. Here's how it works in Java. With the interface, you define it the exact same way as you would with C Sharp. To use variants, Java has wildcards. There's three different kinds. The most basic type is called an unbounded wildcard. We do this by specifying a question mark where the type should be. Now that we have a reference to a basket of any type, such a, uh, now we can have a reference to a basket of any type, such as a basket of fruits. If you want to make the basket behave in a read-only way, or a covariant way, we'll have to place an upper bound on the wildcard. To do this, we can say that the wildcard must extend fruit. Now this basket can actually be an apple basket, and we can get fruits from it. If we try to put a fruit in, the compiler will complain, uh, saying this really weird message, um, which I'm not going to read. If we want to have a co contravariant or write-only basket, we can use the wildcard and specify that it has a lower bound. To do this, we say that the wildcard must be a superclass of the type that you want to add, such as bananas. We can use a basket of fruit for this basket of, basket of wild type super banana. We can add as many bananas as we want to it. If we try to add another fruit, the compiler will complain. Now let's try to get something from it. For some reason, we can pull objects from it, but we can't actually pull any sp other specific types, such as bananas. The compiler will complain as we expect. This makes Java really flexible and powerful. To achieve the same effect in other languages, we need to define vanity interfaces to treat the existing class covariantly or contravariantly. In Java, we can immediately use those structures in a read-only or write-only manner. The only downside to this is the complexity that it imposes on the compiler and the user that has to use this class, because they have to know how to use it correctly. Similar to how comp compilers can infer types, they can also infer variances and tell you if you're doing it wrong, which is really nice. In summary, variance is simply about using generics in a type polymorphic manner. The generic type uh, will either vary with, against, or not at all with the inner type, depending on if we want to use it in a read-only or write-only or read-write fashion. We can do this by adding type annotations, either declaration time or use site time, if our language supports it. Be contravariant with your inputs and covariant with your outputs. Doing so is the principle behind Liskov's substitution principle and robustness principle. Doing so will make your programs robust and flexible. I'd like to thank my company, Capital One, for sending me here. And as a small plug, we're hiring in DC, Plano, SF, and Chicago. Also, thanks to the people at LambdaConf, the LambdaConf organizers, for hosting this awesome conference. And thank you for listening and making this conference happen. Thank you. <laughs>